tonight. The government's outlining new plans to try and help those who've suffered in the post office IT scandal. It comes as the Prime Minister says he would strongly support a decision to strip the former post office boss of her CBE. I'll speak live to Janet Skinner. She lost her home after being wrongly accused of stealing £60,000 and was sent to prison. Many are asking why it's taken a TV drama to bring this story to the top of the headlines. We'll be joined by Will Meller, who stars in it. Also tonight, Richard Sunak's facing a small rebellion in the Commons over his plans to grant new oil and gas licences. And after a weekend of politicians visiting flood-hit communities, we'll ask if they're genuine gestures of support or another photo op. All that and more with Anna Turley and Richard Tice. He will be with us for the next hour. It's Monday, I'm Sophie Ridge live from Westminster and this is The Politics Hub. Hello and welcome to the very first Politics Hub of 2024. Now, I hope you had a restful Christmas and New Year, because honestly, we are going to need it for the year ahead. It's going to be a blockbuster political year. There will, of course, be elections here in the UK, but also in the US and in India, across Europe. A total of more than four billion people are going to be voting. And next Monday, we here on The Politics Hub will be in a new studio that I'm not allowed to show you just yet, but I'm hoping to give you a bit of a sneak peek on Thursday ahead of next week. And in a big election year, as you'd expect, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer are already out and about, shaking hands and making small talk with voters across the country. But we're not going to start the programme tonight with them. We're going to start the programme with the 700 people, more than 700 people, who were wrongly prosecuted for theft and fraud by the post office. Now, you know when politicians slightly glibly talk about hard-working people. We're on the side of hard-working people. This is a budget for hard-working people. Well, that's these guys, sub-postmasters, the people who run your local post office. They are the little guys of the business world, familiar faces on the high street, many with families to support. But between 2000 and 2014, thanks to a faulty IT system, Horizon, reporting cash shortfalls, they were wrongly accused by the post office of stealing. They were dragged through the courts. Some ended up in prison, others even taking their own life. It's actually really awful. And you know what else is pretty awful? The reason we're talking about it today, not because any new information has come to light, but because of a TV drama that's told their story. And the story of the sub-postmasters isn't a glamorous one. These are not privileged or wealthy people. So today, I just can't help thinking, you know, why has it taken a TV show to kick everyone here in Westminster into gear? And with that in mind, we can take you now to the House of Commons, where this evening, MPs are being updated by the government. Let's get the latest from the Minister, Kevin Hollenrake. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The post office scandal is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history shaking people's faith in the principles of equity and fairness that form the core pillars of our legal system. I am very pleased that last week's excellent ITV drama, Mr Bates versus the Post Office, has brought an understanding of the Horizon scandal to a much broader audience. I have received much correspondence about the scandal and the emotional impact the dramatisation has had. Those of us who have been campaigning and working on the issue for some years were already well aware of what happened. I'd like to pay particular tribute, of course, to Alan Bates, his fellow postmasters, uh, including Joe Hamilton and Lee Castleton, and indeed to the Right Honourable Member for North Durham, my Right Honourable Friend for Holton Price and Howden, the Member for Telford, uh, the Member for Jarrow, and the Honourable Member for Motherwell and Wishaw, and indeed, of course, Lord Arbuthnot, yeah. and other members of the Horizon Compensation, and of course, the key figures in the media. They played a key role in seeking justice and compensation for the victims. 
And I also thank the Shadow Secretary of State for his continual constructive approach, as well as, of course, my ministerial predecessors, including my honourable friend, the member for Sutton and Tune. Yeah. Watching last week's ITV programme has only reinforced our zeal for seeing justice done as quickly as possible. We are already a long way down that road. Sir Wynne Williams' inquiry is doing great work in exposing what went wrong and who was responsible. And full and final compensation has already been paid to 64% of those people affected. I previously said to the House that my main concern now is for those still waiting for full and final compensation and the slow pace at which criminal convictions related to Horizon are being overturned by the courts. Before Christmas, the advisory board published a letter which underlined exactly that. This is not just a matter of getting justice for those wrongly convicted. Overturning their convictions is also key to unlocking compensation. Each person whose Horizon conviction is overturned is entitled to an interim compensation payment of £163,000. They can then choose whether to have their compensation individually assessed or to accept an upfront offer of £600,000. That offer is already speeding along compensation for a significant number of people. In the light of the advisory board's letter about overturning convictions, I have spoken to the right honourable member for Durham North and to Lord Abuthanet, and have also had a very positive meeting this afternoon with my honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor. All of us on these benches and across the House are united in our desire to see justice done. We have devised some options for resolving the outstanding criminal convictions with much more pace. My right honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor, will quite rightly need to speak to senior figures in the judiciary about these options before we put them forward. But I am confident that we should be able to implement measures which address the concerns expressed by the advisory board and I hope the Government shall be able to announce these proposals to the House very shortly. Now, of course, there is clearly great concern about the role of the Post Office in prosecuting these cases. The Post Office quite rightly decided to stop undertaking private prosecutions in 2015. If we are to make sure that a scandal like this can never happen again, we need to look at the way in which private prosecutions like these have been undertaken. Any company can bring private prosecution in this way. This is not a special power of the Post Office. I know my right honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor, wants to give this issue proper and thoughtful consideration, and I'm sure he'll report to the House about this issue in due course. Getting justice for the victims of this scandal and ensuring that such a tragedy can never happen again is my highest priority as a minister and has been throughout my 15 months in office. When we talk about compensation, we have to remember that the lives of postmasters and their families caught up in this scandal have been changed forever. They have faced financial ruin, untold personal distress and a loss of reputation that no amount of financial compensation can fully restore. The Government recognises, however, that we have a clear moral duty to right these wrongs to the best of our ability. To support those lives who were turned upside down by this scandal, we have provided significant funding for compensation. And we have been clear that it should not be the taxpayer alone who picks up the tab. We will wait for the inquiry to report to make clear the extent any other organisation's culpability for the scandal and for any individual accountability. Our aim is to ensure that every victim is fully recompensed for their losses and the suffering they have to, had to endure. To date, over £148 million has been paid to 2,700 victims across all compensation schemes. 93 convictions have been overturned, and of these, 30 have agreed full and final settlements. Just over £30 million has been paid out in compensation to those with overturned convictions, including interim payments. Of course, we want to ensure that the process for agreeing compensation is fair, transparent and is open for independent assessment. That is one of the reasons why today I am today announcing that retired High Court Judge Sir Gary Hickenbottom has agreed to chair an independent panel that will assess the pecuniary losses of those postmasters with overturned convictions where disputes arise. This will bring independent oversight of compensation payments, 
in a similar way to Ross, Sir Ross Cranston's oversight of the Group Litigation Order Scheme and the Independent Panel in the Horizon Shortfall Scheme. Of the original 555 courageous postmasters who took the post office to court and who first brought the Horizon scandal into the public eye, £27 million has been paid out to 477 claimants, in addition to the net £11 million received through the December 2019 settlement. 47 members of the original GLO group have also received compensation following the overturning of their convictions, totalling over £17 million. We have received full claim forms from 59 of those postmasters who are eligible for the GLO scheme and issued 43 offers. There have been 21 full and final settlements paid and a further seven full and final settlements accepted. That brings the total number of accepted full and final GLO settlements to 28. I would encourage claimants lawyers to continue to submit GLO claims because my department stands ready to review them and turn them round quickly. It is worth noting too that the 2,417 postmasters who claimed through the original Horizon shortfall scheme have now all received offers of compensation. Around 85% have accepted these offers worth over £107 million. In total, over £91 million has been paid out in the scheme, with the Post Office now dealing with late applications and with cases where initial offers were not accepted. But, Mr Speaker, this is not just about compensation, it's about restoration. The restoring of people's good names and the restoring of the public's trust, both in our personal service and in our justice system. It is therefore only right that we get to the bottom of what went wrong, of who knew, who knew what and when. While the scale of the problem is immense, the Government is unwavering in its resolve to tackle it, to compensate those affected and to leave no stone unturned in the pursuit of justice. We owe that to the victims, to their families, to the memory of postmasters who have died since this tragedy first came to light, and to those who, tragically, took their own lives after being accused of awful crimes they never committed. We owe it to everyone who has been caught up in this tragic miscarriage of justice. Can I thank all my members across this House who are supporting us in this effort. Together, we stand united, not just in memory of those who have suffered, but in shared purpose, to ensure that such a tragedy can never and will never happen again. And I commend this statement to the House. Kevin Holland-Rake uh, there explaining the Government's plans to fast-track the appeals of 750 postmasters uh, there. Well, let's bring in our political editor, Beth Rigby, uh, shall we? Uh, Beth, what did you make of the statement? Mm. Well, Sophie, what's clear about this is that a scandal that has been going on for many, many years suddenly has an urgency about it because of yeah. an ITV yeah. dramatisation, but it genuinely has sparked uh, national outrage about what happened to these postmasters and postmistresses, uh, and the government now under real pressure to act. And if, if you zoom out in terms of the current prime minister, if you think he's had contagion from the Truss and Johnson premierships, he's now, his New Year message, an attempt for another sort of restart, asking the public to stick with him uh, when it comes to the general election, he's now being sort of hounded by what happened actually on David Cameron's watch during the coalition years. Uh, and now this is a problem for him to solve. It wasn't of his making, but now under huge pressure to solve it. And I think what we saw there uh, from Kevin Hollingrate was the government understands that they need to see be seen to deliver on this and do it quickly. So you heard the minister there saying... Uh, that they are going to fast-track appeals of 750 postmasters. Uh, and the Lord Chancellor, that's the Justice Secretary, has come up with a series of ways of, of doing this, uh, and he's going to put it to senior judges for consideration. Uh, and then the minister there saying that they will come back uh, to the House as soon as possible uh, to announce those measures. And then in terms of private prosecutions, um, Holling Rake there saying the government will give proper consideration to the role of private prosecutions. He said, if we're to make sure a scandal like this can never happen again, we need to look at the way in which 
uh, those prosecutions were undertaken because there's an issue of compensation mm -hmm. and there's an issue of people being wrongly convicted. And I think what we're seeing today is a government that does understand the urgency uh, of dealing with this and, and the damage it could cause them, even though it didn't happen on Sunak's watch, uh, if they don't tackle it now. Yeah, we'll be talking to one of the victims uh a little bit later on the uh, programme. But Beth, as she's been mentioning, has been looking at the impact uh, on Rishi Sunak, what he's been doing. Let's have a watch. A stump speech in Accrington to kick off the PM's election year. This marginal red wall seat is what he needs to hold on to to have any hope of staying in number 10. 2023 last year was not an easy year for anyone. But the start of 2024, also far from easy, a scandal not of his making, now giving Rishi Sunak questions to answer. Hundreds of postmasters wrongly criminalised and convicted in the Horizon scandal, still waiting for justice and compensation. This is an absolutely appalling miscarriage of justice. People should look, know that we are on it and we want to make this right. The money's been set aside. Now, what we are now looking at is... How can we speed all of that up? Thank you very much. But inside the room, genuine anger at how long this scandal has dragged out and politicians' failure to act. But do you feel really outraged I about am. it? I am. I'm outraged. It's down to all the government, all them down at House of Commons, yeah. not just one party, all parties. Put your damn heads together, give that lot the money that they deserve. In Loughborough, the Labour leader out and about too with survivors of Storm Henk. Clear the government needs to take action and fast. Compensation needs to be paid. That's already allocated for in the Treasury. They need to get on and pay that. Questions too for the Lib Dem leader, Sir Ed Davey, over his alleged dismissal of victims' concerns during the coalition years when he was the postal minister. I wish I'd known then what we all know now. The post office was lying on an industrial scale to me and other ministers. In Westminster, finally action as the Justice Secretary met with the Postal Minister behind closed doors to talk about speeding up compensation and overturning convictions. Rishi Sunak wanted to kick off the new year with a message to voters, stick with me. But instead, this Prime Minister, already hounded by the contagion of the Johnson then Trust premierships, now finds himself weighed down by what happened under David Cameron's watch over this post office debacle. And the danger for the Prime Minister is that a scandal not of his making only serves to bring his government down further still. Yet another mess left behind by a predecessor clouding this PM's pitch. He wants to be the fresh start, but 13 years of the Tories' track record getting in his way again. Well, Beth Rippey there uh, talking about how an issue not the Prime Minister's making is his to sort out. So I just wanted to remind you of the turnover of ministers who have had responsibility for the post office since those issues with the Horizon IT system first began. So let's go back to Tony Blair's government first. Uh, there was the former Labour MP, Jerry Sutcliffe. Then under Gordon Brown, it was handed on to the Labour peer, Lord Young. And then in 2010, the current leader of the Liberal Democrats, Ed Davey, had responsibility. Then in 2012, it was over to the former Lib Dem MP, Sir Norman Lamb, who took over responsibility for postal affairs, then falling to the former Liberal Democrat leader, Joe Swinson, briefly followed by former Lib Dem MP, Jenny Willett. It was Joe Swinson again in 2014. And then two years later in 2016, it was the then Conservative MP, Margot James, keeping up. Uh, Conservative uh, Kelly Tolhurst then took on the brief uh, under both Theresa May in 2018 and then Boris Johnson as well. But she was then succeeded by the Conservative MP, Paul Scully, in 2020. Right, I'm losing breath now. The last minister to be appointed was Kevin Hollenrake, who currently still holds the position. I think it perhaps underlines a cross-party failure. Many of these former ministers, like Sir Ed Davey, uh, who we've seen tonight, have spoken out and said that they were lied to. But it does, of course, raise the question, why weren't the right oversight systems in place? 
Let's bring in our panel for tonight, shall we? The former Labour MP, Anna Turley, and the leader of the Reform Party, Richard Tice. Great to have you both uh, on the programme. It's, I just can't get my head around the story, right? Because we knew all the facts. I was kind of vaguely aware of it, as, as I'm sure you guys were, were aware of it too. But it's taken this dramatisation to, to really, I think, make everyone realise just what an appalling multiple failure this was. It's an unbelievable failure of politicians, of bureaucrats, and actually, we have to be honest, the media class as well. Because this has been going on for years. You've just cited, I think, I counted 11 mm. different ministers. I may have lost one along the way. And mm. this is unbelievably urgent. I actually think there's not enough focus on the overturning of the convictions. The fastest way to overturn the convictions would be to pass a two- or three-page bill in the House of Commons and the House of Lords, which could be done literally within a week to overturn them all. They're all unsafe. There's also not enough focus Is it on... that easy <clears throat> just to overturn convictions in the courts, though? It, it, it's clearly going to take a lot longer in the courts individually. Mm. Parliament can legislate what it likes. Everybody knows that these people have been seriously wrong. The other focus needs to be on, where's Fujitsu in this? They're completely silent, completely off the playing field, Frankly, the government should be saying, we're going to sue Fujitsu. I calculate it, give or take, 600 grand times over 700, you're approaching 400 million pounds. And that's what needs to be looked at, because all of this is urgent. People are dying without compensation. It's appalling. Mm, yeah, the government's saying that they are going to be trying to look at some of these things. You do get the sense, don't you, that they, like the rest of us, are, are almost kind of playing catch-up. I mean, I mean, what about you, Anna? Have you watched the programme? Or... I have, and it's just shocking. I mean, I felt physically sick watching the first episode. I couldn't believe what those people had been through. I couldn't believe how they were lied to, how isolated they were, how gaslighted they were. And what upset me so much was they kept putting their faith in the British justice mm. system. They kept saying, if I tell the truth, we'll mm. get through this. But, and, and, you know, the post office is a national institution. I I think it's really rocked people's faith in that. And so I think everyone is united that they've got to have the compensation immediately. They've got to have the convictions quashed. They've fought the state for so long. They've had to fight and fight and fight. Now it's time for the state and the entire country to get behind them and give them what they're entitled to. Think... Nothing will ever, ever undo what they've had to suffer and what they've had to go through. But my goodness, we need to come together and look after them now. I think you kind of pick up on something there that I kind of feel as well, how these guys felt that they had faith in the system. Yeah. Because it does feel that, I, I think this is what gets me, you know, these are people who are, you know, effectively like small business sort of owners. They're trying to do the right thing, they're trying to earn some money for their family, they're trying to do right by the community. And it's a massive down. question of trust because individual villagers trust their post office, mm. their postmasters. The postmasters trusted their boss mm. and they trusted what they thought was a big system and they were all told, you're the only one. And that mm. was a blatant lie that everybody up the chain knew. They knew they weren't the only one. And so, yeah, the whole issue of trust, as Anna just says, uh, trust is undermined at every level of the establishment, and it's a massive, massive failure. Mm. And you did see a couple of um, MPs come through, James Arbuthnot, Kevin Jones, others have taken the issue up. And there's something, for me, that is the power and why we're all in politics, to, mm. to hear those voices, to have your constituency surgery and to hear those people and give them a voice of, and run campaigns on issues where you feel like nobody is listening. Mm. That should be a, a, an MP's job to take this up against the system. Something has failed in that the system didn't listen to those MPs, didn't listen to those individual voices, the justice system failed them. And now we have to look all the way through, all the red flags, what was missed, why was nothing done, how did the system close in and, and, and create such a miscarriage of justice? It's, but actually, it's taken way too long. I mean, if you look at it, it's 15 years, 15 mm. plus years. It's approaching 20 years. And we've had just a constant sort of passing the buck. Well, it's not that spicy, it's not that interesting. And uh, to everybody else except those affected. But of course, actually, for, for those. Uh, folk, it's, I mean, it's unbelievable. Mm. It's, and, and, you know, some tragic committed suicide. I was in tears three times as I watched the four mm. episodes. I mean, it's just, you just think, and all credit to ITV for having done a fantastic production, simplifying a very complex, a very complex saga. It's those stories, isn't it, uh, that really bring it uh, yeah. to life. Uh, thanks both uh, for your thoughts on that. And, of course, the uh, story sure to feature in tomorrow's newspapers as well. We'll have our extended press preview and news review from 10.30 this evening with tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Joining us will be the chief executive of Total Politics Group, Mark Wallace, and The Guardian's political editor, Pippa Creer.
You're watching The Politics Hub with me, Safie Ridge. Coming up, we'll be joined live by one of the actors in the new TV drama, which has shone the light on the decades-old post office scandal. Well, I'm a big fan of the Spice Girls. I wrote a book about them back in the day. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I think a lot of their impact has been... Uh, is very clear to see in the modern contemporary scene, you know. I mean, they were there right at the start of, if you like, the modern world, the modern media world. They marketed themselves and they became part of the sort of social fabric. Uh, they were sort of social media people before social media, if you like. On the surface, you know, they were taken as a kind of rather frothy pop phenomenon that uh, <clears throat> that was, you know, for kids, if you like. But I think there was something a bit deeper than that. You know, the girl power uh, was more than just a sort of mantra. I think they did introduce a new idea of... Uh, of uh, that girls could, could flourish on their own without reference to boys so much, necessarily. And I think a, a, a very young generation of kids took that message on board. They made a lot of effort to make yeah. them look good. And, I mean, they've done this before with the Beatles and the Stones and Queen and Iron Maiden, for that matter. So, you know, if you're going to put pop groups on stamps, I think the Spice Girls are as good as anyone uh, for that kind of purpose. And the fact is the Beatles were a complete phenomenon in the 60s. They revolutionised everything. They, they, they created the world that we live in for music terms. But I think the Spice Girls were as much of an... Of a, have an influence on the on the way that the media world developed around ce the celebrity world that we live in now. I think they had a huge impact. Yeah. So I mean, and also they were they were very part of that whole Brit Britpop um, revolution of the 90s. You know, they were very much representative of Britain in a lot of a lot of ways. And people will be cynical about it, but I think that uh, that they did a lot uh, in in that sense. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the programme, the renewed interest in the post office scandal hasn't come about because of a new development in the story, but instead a new TV drama. Now, the actor Will Meller is one of those starring in the RTV drama. I'm going to speak to him live in a moment. First, though, here he is in Mr Bates versus the post office. £26,000 gone missing. You what? 26 grand. Let's go through those figures again right now. Not allowed. Hey? Suspended. Locked out my own post office till I pay it all back. 26,000? What are we going to do? Fight. Well, Will Meller uh, joins us now. Thanks so much for being on the programme, uh, first of all. Hi, no um, problem. Obviously, I want to talk to you, but I guess the reason you're here is partly the character that you were playing in, in his story, Lee Castleton. What happened to him? Just tell our viewers. Well, Lee um, was having problems with his Horizon system and um, he, he called them 91 times, uh, the, the support team, saying there's problems, that it wouldn't balance, the books wouldn't balance, that no one would listen to him. Uh, and he ended up owing over £26,000, um, which he obviously couldn't afford to pay. He was panicking, they shut his post office um, and he said, and they sent him a letter to go to court. And he said, I just represent myself and I just tell the truth. I show him my figures and show that I haven't taken this money. Um, so he goes to court against this huge, you know, company and uh, representing himself. The judge didn't believe him. And then he walked out owing over 300,000 because he had to pay the legal costs. And he'd done absolutely nothing wrong. Um, yes. It's a sad story for all of them, but, you know, because I had to play him. It was, it was tough, you know, reading what he went through. It's that thought, isn't it, that, you know, he just thinks, if I tell the truth, have faith in the legal system, 
it will be okay. And it obviously wasn't okay. And I think that moment, you know, where we just saw you uh, playing that part uh, really captured that. You met him, I think, I'm right in saying, at a BAFTA screening. What happened? Yeah, I, I'd never met him because I tried to, I asked if I could meet him and I think he was a bit hesitant because obviously we're saying we're making this drama uh, and ITV were making it and, and I think he was a little bit hesitant. I mean, obviously didn't want to go back down that road and, and I understand mentally it was, it's been so tough for him. He must have thought, do I want to revisit it? And then I thought, well, I don't want to put the pressure on and we did as much research as we could, but I never met him. And then you just pray and hope that you've played it right. And then I met him at the BAFTA screen and I had a coffee in my suitcase and I could open the door and someone opened the door for me. I went, oh, thanks, mate. And he went, I'm Lee Castleton. <laughs> and, and my jaw dropped and I put my coffee down and we, I just grabbed him and we hugged. Um, and, we, and we stayed there for a longer, longer than you would if it was just a normal hug. It was an emotional moment because he knows that I know what he's been through and it was just a bit of a release as well. It was like, And he was so happy with what he'd seen, which meant the world to me. So it was an unbelievable moment. Yeah, it's interesting you just said that, you know, you pray and hope that you got it right. I'm sure you feel that responsibility with all the roles that you play, but was there something about Lee's story that made you feel that responsibility? Massive difference in playing a real person that's still alive and, you know, is gonna is gonna watch it. And there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. And it's and I think this is bigger than any drama I've done. It's bigger than any series I've done because it's a true story and because it's still happening. And because we knew there was going to be a reaction, so it's not just a TV show, it's not just a dramatisation or a fictional drama. This is real people and real lives. And that's what struck me when I read it. And I was overwhelmed with the fact they wanted me to play the part, but at the same time, there's a responsibility. You've got to get it right. Um, but we're, I'm amongst some amazing actors. It's a fantastic cast, and, uh, and I'm so proud to be in it and be involved with it. More importantly, I'm so glad it's landed with the nation and now these people are being heard, which is all they want. And hopefully we're going to get justice for these people. So, yeah, it's a lot bigger than just the drama. This is huge. Mm. Do you think it's right that it's may have taken a TV drama to get justice for these people in the end? No, it's not right. It's not right. They shouldn't have gone through a, a day of what they went through, never mind 20 years. I mean, life is a gift, man. What price do you put on someone's life being taken? I mean, these people, some people killed themselves, went to prison. You know, um, Lee, he got, the kids got bullied at school and he, his daughter had problems and he was completely desperate. And, um, you know, and people went, the lady who's lost her childhood memories because she had to go through treatment for depression. Uh, and it's just, what price do you put on that? So they shouldn't have suffered one day because they did nothing wrong. So it's not right it took a drama. But, you know, it's better late than never. Let's make sure this doesn't go away. Stop making it. Stop letting them kick the can down the road. And let's get these people looked after properly. And then let's let's hold these people responsible. Who did this to these people? I don't know how they slept at night. Do you think it shows the power of TV, of, of stories, I guess? Because we've known about this, you know, in the back of our minds for years. And yet suddenly it's captured people's attention. You know, I've had people messaging me about it. I hope you're going to cover the post office scandal on the show. Um, an unbelievable response and um, yeah I think sometimes it takes people to feel something you know when you read something on a bit of paper it's a lot different to when you actually see it and I think with, with it being dramatised like this people have gone through the emotions with them they've gone through the stories with them they feel connected to them so now they, they feel like they know them which is important because then they have a passion about it um, and that's what the response I've had the message I've had which I'm very grateful for uh, people messaging me all the time saying how much they've enjoyed it and how, how it angered them and how they want to make a difference and people signing the petition and it's great um, and that, and if that's what it takes we've done the right thing and I, and I think ITV have done a fantastic job with this and I'm like I said before I'm so proud to be involved in it. Well thank you so much for talking to us uh, this evening and uh, you know as you say you know Lee's Castleton happy with your performance I don't think you can get much uh, better credit than that. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's all I wanted. I was over the moon when he said he was happy. So, thanks very much. Thanks for your support. Thank you. You're watching The Politics Hub with me, Safie Ridge. Coming up, we will be joined by one of the real-life victims of the scandal next.
Welcome back. Time now for our most important interview uh, of the evening. We can talk to one of the victims of the post office scandal. Uh, now, I'm delighted to say we are joined by the former sub postmistress, Janet Skinner. Janet, thank you so much for being uh, on the programme this evening. Thank you for telling us your story. So, you were a postmistress. Where were you working? In Hull. And was it a you know, particular dream of yours to sort of work in a post office? How did it come about? Um, no, it was just by chance. Um, the lo one of the local post offices um, where I lived um, on the council, one of the council estates was advertising for a counter clerk um, and it was just to cover the lunch times to like 10 till 2. Um, and so I applied um, and I got the job. That was in 1994. Yeah. So, so there you are. You're in Hull. You, you applied to a job advert. You're mum of two. Yeah. And then suddenly they accuse you of stealing. What, what happened? Yeah, well, I mean, I worked for them for over 12 years um, and they basically just held me accountable because I was the post mistress. It was my responsibility to make good what was lost. How much money was lost? Sorry? How much money did they say had been lost? It was 50, 59,000. Um, they said that I'd, well, that I was responsible for. I mean, I just can't get my head around how that how that happens, something like that. You know, there you are doing your job, working hard, trying to provide for your family, and you get accused of being yeah. responsible for that amount of money. You were given a nine month sentence. You went to jail. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yes. And it wasn't just any jail. It was the same jail that Rose West was held in. Yes. I mean, um, I, just... I mean obviously, I didn't know at the time. Um, I served six weeks in um, Newall, which is Wakefield, and I served five weeks in Drake Hall. Um, and then I was, when I was released, I was released on um, TAG. So I had um, and the big an black ankle bracelet thing on for up to the end of July of 2007. I mean, I just can't really get my head around what that must have been like. I can't imagine what jail is like. I'm sure that's how you were as well. You know, you've never committed a crime, never done anything wrong, and then suddenly you find yourself in jail. I mean, how how was that? It's just... I mean, the first few weeks, um, I just don't remember anything. It was a horrendous time. Um, I think I just cried that much, probably didn't have any more tears left to cry. Um, they, they had me on suicide watch and it was just, then I just had to fall. You just have to go with with what you've been given. I had no choice. They weren't just going to let me walk out the door. So I had to just adapt to what where I was, to be honest. And you had two, you've got two children. How old were they when you were sent to jail? My daughter was 17 and my son was 14. Um, the day that I went to prison, I didn't even tell them. I told they knew I was at court, but I didn't tell them what it was for. Um, and so the um, my daughter rang to speak to her, and she just she just couldn't come to the phone. She couldn't speak to me. She was in such an emotional state. I think that just made it worse for me. Mm. I can imagine that. I'm so sorry that you and also your family had to go through this. It's just absolutely appalling. Um, you had health issues afterwards as well. You had a collapse. You were left paralysed. Yeah, yeah. What, what happened? So um, I sold my house in 2007 and I sold it because it was um, going up for repossession. But the post office had worked out that there was going to be £11,000 left out of the sale. So they put a confiscation order for £11,000 compensation. What was it like? So they then, I just carried on with my life. We rented a property, lived in rented accommodation, and 
a friend of mine had just got myself a job and a friend had contacted me and said that I was in the paper. And I said, what do you mean I'm in the paper? And he said, for non-payment of your compensation order. And what I didn't know is all of the letters they'd been sending to the house that I lost. So I didn't receive any of the letters saying that they hadn't received this money. Um, it was due to the mortgage companies that had given me a penalty um, for early settlement. So it literally wiped out any profit that was left in it. Um, I had to hand myself into Sheffield Crown Court. I was arrested. I was put in cells for the day. Um, I was told I was going to be given a five-year prison sentence for not paying them. Um, and a couple of weeks after it all concluded, two weeks after it all finished, um, I ended up going to hospital because I just felt there was something not right. I felt like I was on a boat and I, and I wasn't really stable in myself. Um, and within 24 hours, I was paralysed from the neck down. Mm. I mean, it must just have felt like you were in like a never-ending nightmare. Like, you you know, you serve your sentence and they're still coming after you. What was it like yes. to watch the TV programme? That was, it was, um, it's funny because I was watching um, Will Miller and I was actually on the phone with Lee about 20 minutes ago. Um, and it was, it was, it was quite heart wrenching at times watching it. Um, because obviously, even though I'm not characterized within it, everything that you saw within it, I've been part of. Um, I mean, I got involved with the JSV in 2011, so I've gone through the whole process. Mm -hmm. So it's quite, and to, I mean, the story itself, it's literally the tip of the iceberg. So many stories out there, it's just unreal. But it's brought it to the public and given the public a chance to be able to see exactly how what we've had to deal with, but seeing it from the opposite side. I think reading it, I thought people don't tend to take as much notice, but having it there in front of you, they've been able to live part of what we've had to live with for the past over 15 years and like you say everyone has a story we'll have to get Leon tomorrow we've been talking about him all evening so get see if he'll come on tomorrow <laughs> um yeah. thank you so much for sharing your uh, story with us this evening it's it's just extraordinary uh, what's happened to you um, That's great. so all power to you for getting through it and um again you. you know I'm very sorry it happened to you thank you yes thank you so much thank you Janet Skinner, uh, they're talking about her unbelievable uh, miscarriage of justice uh, against her. Still to come on The Politics Hub. Up next, the government's been outlining its plans to deal with the post office scandal. We'll get some reaction from one of the MPs who led the campaign in a moment. I'm Stuart Ramsey, and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. Well, there's a real sense now that people are beginning to expect that this whole airlift is coming to an end, and they're really, really desperate. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people and putting them into trucks. You either live and recover, or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We've been crushed. To take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, we're right. An enormous explosion has just come down. I think it was a monster that just landed in between us. The information on this could bring down the entire network, not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the world. It's not out of control, but the pig we're drawing it's so, so hot.
Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. I just wanted to have a quick reflection, I guess, on uh, Janet's uh, interview with uh, Anna and Richard. It was that moment, wasn't it, I think, when she was talking about not telling her kids yeah. um, about uh, ahead of going to court? Absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, how do you tell your children that? And the isolation of knowing that you're innocent and you've told the truth, but no one believes you, and then having to deal with the consequences, going to prison, the shame, the stigma, it's absolutely How horrendous. many hundreds, if not thousands, of children sort of have grown up thinking that, that one of their parents is a thief, is a crook, is a criminal? And, and just the common sense. Supposedly, Janet's stealing £56,000. We're not talking about a few hundred quid here and there. Mm. There's no way. I mean, where was this common sense in the post office managers saying, this can't be right, something must be wrong. Hundreds of people making tens and tens of thousands of pounds. And that's what comes across from Janet. You know, we see the, the, those that are in the drama, but she's not even in the drama. How many more Janets are there that we haven't heard their stories and that will we, we, come to life, I hope, and they'll get to tell their stories. But well, again, why was no one saying well, prior to Horizon? We ha how many yeah. uh, prosecutions <laughs> did they have? All of a sudden after Horizon, are all of these sub postmasters are criminals around the country. It was no one in the post office looking at this with a degree of humanity and saying, how, how can this be feasible? I'll have more uh, from you uh, later on, but let's uh, go now to the House of Commons, uh, shall we? We can go to the Central Lobby and talk to Kevin Jones. He's an MP who's been campaigning on this issue for many years. I just want to check uh, in to hear what he's heard from the government uh, tonight. First of all, you've been talking about tonight saying, oh, we, we didn't care about this until there was a TV drama. Well, that's not true of you, to be fair, is it? This has been a fight that you've been looking at for a while. Well, no, but when we discussed it before Christmas, I think there were five of us in the chamber. I think it was packed tonight because it's clearly got uh, the imagination of people and you know, credit to the, do the drama for highlighting the cases. And you've just interviewed Janet and her case is very typical. And the idea that anyone could think that these people, when you meet them, were master criminals uh, was crazy. Uh, but they were put through complete hell and we need to uh, get justice for them. What do you make of the government's response? Well, we have some movement. Uh, before the uh, before Christmas, uh, I sit on the, along with James Abuthnot on the uh, Post Office Horizon uh, Advisory Board. We wrote to the uh, Justice Secretary suggesting that the 927 conviction should be quashed. Uh, only 93 so far have been. Uh, what has been announced tonight is that uh, steps are going to be taken to look at a way of doing that. Uh, the Minister has agreed that on Wednesday we'll meet uh, the Advisory Board again to talk through our proposals, but I'm quite determined to ensure that we get these convictions overturned. Uh, even this afternoon I had a phone call from someone who'd been convicted and still not come forward. When you talk to these victims, you understand why. They're not going to go anywhere near a courtroom uh, through the trauma they've been put through. Yeah, you can totally see that, can't you? And then why do you think it is that you know, this is an issue that we have known about for a while, right? You know, it's not a new piece of information. Why are these people have only just now been listened to? Well, I think the key point is uh, James and I have been at this for many years uh, and quite a few other MPs have as well, some are no longer in the House. But I think the important point is, is that what the drama did, it told the story. And unless you've actually met these uh, individuals and see what uh, decent and ordinary people they were in their communities and the art ache which they've been put through and devastation in their lives, then, you know, I don't think you fully appreciate that. And I think anyone looking at that drama or anyone who met any of these uh, victims, frankly, would come to the conclusion that who on earth thought any of these were criminals? It's a good question. Uh, thank you very much indeed for being on the show tonight. I'll let you get back to your work in the Commons. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, let's look at another story. It's been a programme dominated, of course, uh, by the uh, post office uh, scandal. But a cold snap is set to grip parts of the UK tonight. It was actually snowing uh, here in Westminster earlier. But that is enough of my uh, weather report because the serious part of this story uh, is that there is a warning that there could be more flooding in central England. Now, in recent days, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer have been out visiting those affected by the floods. It's a job that politicians often feel obliged to do, but it doesn't always go to plan. We're all similar, and as similar to the one I've seen, that kind of stuff. I'm not very 
careful about talking to yourself if you don't mind, I'll just know what I'm doing. Right. Um, if she's not held to the professor, I don't want you to do so. help us clear it rather than us have to claim everything on the insurance then we can't get any insurance from our company and if we do well, it costs you can, us too you can due to the flood reprogram which we actually put in place get his boots It's almost a bit of a rite of passage, isn't it? Politicians getting the wellies on, having to go and visit, you know, the kind of flood hit uh, areas. Um, have either of you had any experience of uh, playing about in the floods? I can see you nodding. Yes, yeah. As an MP, I went to visit some constituents who had had terrible flooding um, and it was heartbreaking to turn up to their homes and see the entire contents of their house tipped out on, into their front garden. And actually, you can, as a, as a politician, as an MP, make an immediate difference to people there. If you do the practical things around helping them with insurance, helping them get emergency accommodation, there are lots of practical ways you can help. I don't think they wanted tea and sympathy. They wanted someone there to help them with those practical solutions. So there is a, certainly a role you can play. Mm. But actually, the reason to do it is because of the previous story, to actually to see and experience mm. the impact of not dealing with defences, not clearing out ditches and sewers and drains. You then see the impact of that. Uh, and it brings it home to people in the same way if, if more MPs had, and, had gone to talk to sub-postmasters who were being charged and convicted, I think they probably might have raised questions earlier. And I guess if you are a lightning rod, that's fair enough. People are annoyed, they're angry. Yeah, absolutely. And you're there to, to show that you care. And it's really important. People want to know that you care. Whether you whether politicians do or not, it's important that people know that they feel listened to. But there's a, there's a bigger point as well, which is not just that practical help and support there in the constituency, but also you take those stories, you take what that means, as Richard said, back to Parliament. So you look at what the root causes of flooding. What are you going to put in place for the resilience? How are you going to make sure this doesn't happen again? And that's the difference you can make. And doing it quickly. That's the key point. Now, we haven't got long on the programme, but I have to ask you this, right, because I've had loads of people on Twitter uh, talking to me about the fact you're not going to be standing a candidate in the upcoming by-election, even though you've been making such a big deal about running in Yeah, every because, frankly, what Chris Goodmore has done, I think, is an abuse of council taxpayers' resources. It'll cost £250,000. Yes, yeah, so won't be able to go into you, other local why you, services. Why don't you put a candidate no, against him? Because it's, it's That's abusive. That's a reason to no, frankly, what we're calling, no, What we're calling for is that he should repay those council taxpayers. He's got plenty of money. He's earning hundreds of thousands of pounds from additional eco-contracts. The whole thing's an outrage. I feel very, very strongly about it. So, so why on principle, a... because it's only going to be there. The seat's being abolished. Leave, that's why. The seat's being abolished in a matter of months. Come it's on. disgraceful. No, it's appalling. There's be over a million sheets of paper. He's supposed to care about the environment. How many thousands of trees are going to be chopped down for that ridiculous by-election for a few months? The man should be ashamed of himself. So why don't you run a candidate saying that? Because I want to make on but point of principle, it's an abuse of taxpayers' cash. You must not, as a politician, have such disregard for taxpayers' cash. And that's what he's got. He should be ashamed of himself. Sounds like democracy to me. There's an election because someone felt so strongly about uh, the, the decisions made by the Prime Minister, they wanted to stand down. So we'll have an election and we'll fight it hard. Well, and I, and I hope Richard, million, about Richard is talking of, about setting... What about the quarter of a million of taxpayers' cash that's been completely wasted on you, all this Richard, for a few months? You, you're talking about standing candidates. I really, really hope that you're going to be a man of your word and stand candidates in every seat. Everywhere. I, I pledge it to everybody to you, and we both to Sophie. Yeah, we're going to hold you to that. You will hold me to that. <laughs> Absolutely right. Uh, needed a little bit of a disagreement at the end of the programme, I think. Uh, after so much agreement throughout the programme. Thank you both uh, for being on the show. Well, that is it from us uh, tonight, but I'll see you tomorrow at 7pm. Up next, though, it is SJ with the UK tonight, so stick around for that, and I'll see you tomorrow at 7 